Okay, I think it's just best if we if we just address it right away. If we just call out the elephant in the room. Last video, I was very shiny, extremely shiny. I don't know why, and I also don't know why Anna didn't say anything about it because she was sitting right there staring at me, but I was very shiny. I also have a favorite comment from, well, I have two favorite comments. One of them is just from a guy named Eric, and his icon is Beavis and Butthead, and he said, he's so new, he's shiny. That's pretty funny. And then the other one was Ken Stevenson, who said, Michael is shining like a Seattle vampire. Hope to see more of him. Actually, he said, hope to see more of him, but I think he meant two. Boom, watch fam. What is up, watch fam? My name is Michael from Theo and Harris, and today I want to talk about how I funded my first feature film by selling watches, doing watch videos, and photographing watches, so let's do it. All right, before we start, wristwatch check. I am wearing the Cura Atavia from, which I think I'm saying that right, it's a portmanteau I found out between automobile and aviation, so ah, uh, aviation, or AVA. So, Atavia. No, I, you see I was breaking it down correctly and I still said it wrong. It's Atavia. So, just keep that in mind as I mispronounce it for the next 20 minutes. I think is how you say it. So, this watch is actually in the Theo and Harris watch shop. You can check that out here. And this watch was the collaboration with Viceroy, a cigarette company. But I won't go into a lot of detail about that now. But I do want to see, I'm thinking of doing a series called Stolen from the Shop. Where basically I look at all the vintage watches that we have. And if there's one I think is cool, I just do a little semi-review on it. Obviously the watches are gonna be like 50 years old, so I, I'm not gonna be like, well, I would have changed this because it's it's just old. But either way, I feel like it'd be really cool to just grab an old watch and talk about it. I'll try to get the weirdest watches too. If there's a really weird oddball coming in, I would definitely review that. So if you're interested in that, just let me know, comment below. I like to post the video and then just very slowly scroll through all the comments and then I refresh and I'm like, oh, another one. So I'll definitely read it. Also, in bigger news, you should definitely subscribe because we're almost at 100,000 subscribers and when we get there, we're giving away a Rolex date just for free. So if you're in that group of 100,000 people, we will just ship it out to you. I don't know how we're gonna do that, probably through the mail. Anyway, so real quick, before I made my feature film, I made eight short films over, I think, four years, five years. I made my first short film my senior year of high school. That's online, actually. It's called Evasion. Please don't watch it. And if you find that video, you will also find some really cringy videos of me along the way. So that's always fun. So anyways, I did eight short films, kind of like a boot camp. So that way, my feature film, I kind of had more experience and, you know, all that jazz. And I ended up doing my first feature film my senior year of college, January 2018. 18. I think 2018, maybe 2017. So we were supposed to film the month of January, my winter break, 31 days, every single day. But what ended up happening was, you know, obvious stuff like weather, but then some people got sick. Actually, the two lead actors got sick for the first two weeks. So those days were kind of bagged. Some people just went nuts, like The Shining, which was great. We actually got stuck in a very old mansion at 3 a.m. and all the lights were off. The only thing that was actually scarier was a jump scare in the TV show Haunting on Hill House. If you've seen this show, you know what I'm talking about. But there's this one jump scare that I actually involuntarily screamed at, which I've never done before. I didn't know I was a screamer, but turns out if you scare me enough, I just, I will scream. My girlfriend Taylor went like this, and I just for some reason full on like yodeled. Search on YouTube, Haunting on Hill House jump scare, it's there because it's so scary. Anyway, so the feature film, I'll talk about that in a different video about it or whatever, but getting funding for it, I did actually mostly through watches. So I was super into watches at the time, still am now obviously working for a watch company. Basically my sophomore year of college, I was like, okay, I know I'm gonna do a feature film and I need to start putting money away now so I can fund it just because I'm in college, I'm not gonna make a ton of money. So I basically did three things. I photographed watches for a guy that was flipping them on Reddit. I flipped my own watches on Reddit. I used to take these pictures. Then I would write these massive three page write-ups about the watches and then I would make like 20 bucks per watch or something like that. And then that was about the time that Anna said they were looking for an editor. So I emailed her and I said, hey, I can edit, here's what I do, here's the eight short films I did, here's this, here's that, and she said, great, okay, edit videos for us, idiot. And I did, and it was great. So basically, it was like the best of both worlds for me because I was in love with watches, I needed to make money, and I wanted to see as many watches as I could, and I wanted to wear them and stuff like that, obviously. So photographing watches for that other guy was great because he would just send me 60 watches in the mail at a time, all packaged separately, by the way, which was absolutely horrible because I went to college obviously and I would get an email every single time I got a package and I would be in class trying to learn about computer science because that's also what I majored in which 
Not as fun as watches, <laughs> little secret. But I'd be in class and I would literally get 65 emails in a row that just say, your package is ready, your package is ready, your package is ready. And then I would get there and the mailroom people would just be like, oh, you're the guy that got 65 packages in one day that are all this big. And I'd be like, yeah, that's me. And they're all watches, baby. And then I'd open them in front of them and be like, look, a Rolex, look, another Rolex, look, an Omega. But yeah, that was a lot of fun. And I always had like $60,000 worth of watches in my college dorm room that didn't lock. So high risk, very low reward considering how much I got paid to do that. But it was still really fun. And I don't know if I got fired from that job or not. I made one huge mistake where like 30 watches for some reason sold within two days. So I had to ship out 30 watches at the same time. And I didn't really have a method for doing that. So I would just like package them up, write the address, do it, whatever. And I had a spreadsheet and the spreadsheet was off by one. So I sent like 35 watches to 35 of the wrong people. And that's not actually what got me fired. I got a lot of watches sent to me after that and kept going and you know kept the guy that I was working with updated. He kept me updated. But one time I said, hey, I really like this watch. Can you put it to the side for me? Because he didn't ship it to me yet. And he said, sure. And then like a day later, I said, hey, actually, never mind. I can't afford it. And he freaked out and then stopped talking to me and didn't send me any other watches. So I don't know why that, I don't know why that was the thing. So that was that. And actually, before that guy stopped talking to me, I said, hey, I think I'm going to start flipping watches. Do you have any tips? And he gave me a whole ton of tips about like what he does and how to do it and this and that and whatever. And I basically, I started with one Omega, which was I think 180 bucks. And I didn't really have a lot more money than that. So I was like, okay, that'll be all the money I put in. I'll buy one Omega and then I'll sell it for... I don't know, like 250, and then I'll just get another Omega and I'll keep doing that until I can get two. So in the beginning, I basically tried to find a watch that was in really good condition, both mechanically and aesthetically, and then I would just photograph it really well, put it up on Reddit or somewhere for a little bit more, sell that, then eventually, once I got enough, I would buy two Omegas. It was all Omega at the time, but I would get two Omegas, do that again, try to get three, try to get four. Once I started to sell like three, four, five watches at a time, I bumped up and then I got a Rolex and I kept being like, maybe I'll just keep it. Maybe I don't need to make a film. And it was really cool because that's actually how I got my first Rolex and I like wore it all around campus. It was like a really cheap, kind of rusted, corroded Rolex precision look like this. And I had it and I kept it on and I was just like trying to show people. It was like 34 millimeters, so it was tiny. But I was absolutely over the moon. And I wore that watch for three days, then sold it for like, hundred dollars profit because it wasn't really that good of a watch but then i started to get into like that level of watches like speedmasters date just precisions just you know general oyster cases from the 50s and 60s and stuff like that and then i actually got into the vintage 80s automatic men's cartier santos which still to this day is one of my favorite watches of all time and i got into those a lot and i would buy like two or three at a time sell those selling all gold tanks which again theon harris does that all the time but for me at the time it was incredible because I've never seen any of these watches before or like held such nice watches all the time. So I was freaking out, especially because obviously I was making money and I could put money away for the film. Yeah, I wasn't trying to make the flipping business like an actual big business. I just needed all of the money for the film. So I ended up getting to a certain point where I had enough watches kind of in rotation along with photographing the watches because that spilled over onto that a little bit and editing with Theo and Harris that I had a good amount of income coming in and I didn't want to expand anymore just because it was a lot of work at the time. So anyways, what I ended up doing was when I had like eight to 10 grand in inventory of watches starting from just that Omega, I just stopped the business, basically. I stopped buying watches. So I liquidated everything, got fired from that other job, and was still working for Theo and Harris, and I had all that money, I put it towards the film, spent it all, and I was like, great. And I got to keep a Cartier Santos, so I was thrilled. The film was done, and then a girl I was dating at the time said, hey, the only reason that I didn't like go on vacation for my winter break was because you said you'd pay me for making food for everybody every day, and I was like, oh, right. So I had to sell the Santos so I could pay her, which is really sad now that I think about it because that was the momentous watch for me. I was like, I did it. I funded my film all by myself with watches. This is great. And then I had to sell it. But what was great was I sold the Santos and I had some money left over. So I reached out to Anna and I said, hey, my premiere is in May. Is there any way if I give you this money and kind of work on credit towards a Rolex, you'll send me a date just that I can have. And she said, yeah, that sounds great. So the 1601 that I wear that I got from Theo and Harris was actually, I got that the day before my premiere. And it's a really special watch because the film was probably the most important thing I've ever done in my life. So it worked out really well. And I wear that watch basically every day with pride. And the plan 
is actually I don't want to tell you the plan because it involves me getting married. So we'll wait until I get married, then I will let you know. Also, the best part about this entire story is I was so happy we got the money. The first day of filming, we were doing an underwater shot, this one to be specific. And I was wearing a waffle shirt and I went down to the bottom of the pool and the shirt got like 30 times bigger than I expected. And when I went to swim up, the shirt actually like went over my head and then like wrapped around and I couldn't find the surface, so I was just like swimming around, not being able to breathe. Then when I finally got to the surface and I got to the top, the shirt was so tightly wrapped around my face and so full of water that I still couldn't breathe, so I like gasped and pulled it off, which was horrible. I can't imagine if I raised all that money and then I died before the film started. That would have sucked, but I didn't, so now I work here. Anyways, so that's that, but wait, one second. If you like me, and you want to see more of me talking about things other than watches, subscribe to my other YouTube channel, The Iron Snail. That would be really cool. It's a fun time over there too. Also, that one, that I just do that one by myself. So I just, I just go crazy. Anyways, I will see you all in the next one. Let me know what you think about Stolen from the Shop.